today's presentation is titled Impossibility of Return, uh, Sex Work Movement, Anti-Trafficking and Victimhood in Shonagati in India. And this is based upon my uh, current book manuscript, which is titled Prophylactic Rights, Sex Work, HIV AIDS and Anti-Trafficking in Shonagati. It is based on ethnographic work between 2011 and 2019 with Durbar Mohila Shamanoy Committee, a grassroots sex workers collective in Shonagatsi, the iconic red light district in Kolkata. Now, in the interest of time, what I've planned today is first I'll give you an overview of the research, like the entire research that I've done, uh, and then I'll follow it up with a closer look at a very specific aspect of anti-trafficking, but because as we, you will soon realize that anti-trafficking is an extremely complex uh, matter. So I can go to the second slide. So to give you some context, uh, in 1992, following a baseline survey, the All India Institute of Hygiene and Public Health identified sex workers as a high risk group and launched the Sexually Transmitted Diseases uh, HIV Prevention Program, which was known as SHIP in Shonagati. Aligned with the goal, global programming, SHIP, uh, this project was based on, peer, on the peer education model where sex workers were recruited to introduce others, other sex workers to the basic geology of HIV AIDS and other STDs and promote the condom as a prophylactic device. In addressing structural barriers, that is poverty and stigma, SHIP achieved remarkable success in introducing new HIV infections through the sustained use of condoms. And the picture that you see on the slide, which says, HIV intervention, and it's not uh, totally clear because the tree was in the way. This is actually the first uh, project office of this, and this is located in Shonagachi. Now, most importantly, <clears throat> what, this prevent, what this program did was it extended HIV AIDS narrative beyond public health. It drew attention to the corporeal threat the epidemic posed to the labor and livelihood of sex workers as well. The rearticulation of HIV AIDS as a question of the laboring body motivated sex workers to collectivize and found Durbar Mohila Shamanoi Committee in 1995, hence where they'll be referring uh, to the organization as Durbar. In 1997, Durbar went on to establish the self-regulatory board to prevent the trafficking of minors and unwilling women into Shonagatsi. And this is actually in the latter part of the talk, I'll elaborate more on this. That same year, that is 1997, Durbar was a key participant in drafting what is known as the Sex Workers Manifesto, a first of its kind in the world, which was adopted as the first national conference of sex workers in India, which was held in Kolkata. Public health scholars and practitioners endorsed the Shonagashi project as a globally replicable model for peer education, for community, mobilization and empowerment, but I don't quite accept empowerment uncritically. So take that in quotes, uh, empowerment of especially marginalized communities. Durbar is also globally upheld as a grassroots initiative to demand the decriminalization of sex work and the amendment of the anti-trafficking laws so that sex workers can sa safely access preventive medical uh, services. Now, uh, to think about what is the significance, why would I select Durbar to do this study? Or, you know, I was thinking about my days years ago in grad school, we had to defend this question, like, so what? Uh, so I thought I would name this slide as a homage to my grad school days, which was years ago. So first of all, Durbar is a grassroots movement uh, and very successfully has been able to calibrate the issue of risk and crime, risk meaning risk as in HIV, uh, in AIDS and other STDs, but not just as a public health discourse, but also a risk to their uh, bodies. So in a way, and also crime, because anti-trafficking, as I will soon elaborate, is very embedded within a carceral approach and a criminal justice approach. So it kind of recalibration of risk and crime. This was the first time we see this coming out of a grassroots movement in India. Second, the movement developed outside the parameters of the larger uh, women's movement in India. And I'm generalizing here a little bit, but to just to give you an idea, it, it's a very marginalized group, historically marginalized group of women who actually collectivize 
outside of the entire women's uh, movements, like the larger, uh, you know, the larger paradigm. And third, Durbar centered the question of labor on female sexuality, which also challenged the Bhadralok or the middle class politics of respectability, specifically in Bengal. And I can talk more about that. There were actually, there was a time when housewives were actually writing letters to the editors, um, you know, contesting the sex work rights, which actually is very interesting. Now, fourth, at a time when the abolitionist rhetoric, and abolitionist rhetoric, I mean abolition of prostitution. Fourth, at a time when the abolitionist rhetoric is gaining strength globally alongside governance feminism, uh, to uphold sex workers' rights is rather challenging. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, this is the first time we hear the voice of the sex worker herself in India as a political member claiming her place as rights bearing citizens of the nation state. Now for the analytic framework of the uh, book of the larger project, um, I critique the uh, on kind of the uncritical adoption of both sex work and sex workers as objective and a priori categories. Drawing on intersectional feminist theory, post-colonial scholarship, labor historians, and others, the analytical framework I have developed overlays medical and legal anthropology. And through what I have termed, as you can see on the slide here, uh, the risk crime unstable, I trace the emergence of the sex work subjectivity at the confluence of the HIV AIDS and anti-trafficking surveillance. I show how labor as a political category emerged through a complex duality where sex workers both submitted to the surveillance regimes while at the same time subverting them. I just wanted to take a little more time to talk more about the risk crime unstable. Um, and when we look at the medical legal regime in India, it poses a specifically interesting conundrum. Now, the, on one hand, the National AIDS Control Organization, which is our um, NACO, which is the nodal agency for HIV AIDS programming in the country, has consistently promulgated quote unquote sex workers and sex work. Uh, in what is known as targeted intervention, sex workers were identify as, identified as high-risk groups and have been inducted into the National AIDS Control Program, which is in its fourth stage now. Now, for NACO to use sex work and sex workers is in adherence to the international guidelines, though actually there's a caveat here. In, since 2007, however, UN AIDS has promoted the use of quote unquote key populations, but this change has really not uh, made much impact in India because the NACO still refers to sex workers and others as a um, high risk group. Now, on the other hand, the legal system in India, which is a colonial vestige like the, um, that most of the legal system there is, still uses prostitute and prostitution. Now, further laws regarding anti-trafficking and commercial sex in India is a deeply fragmented terrain and are erratically evoked, evoked by the state to penalize sex workers and violate their human rights. The first is prostitution is conflated with trafficking, mainly in the Immoral Trafficking Prevention Act. Now, just to start with, this is a uh, this is a pretty complex terrain, and I just want to walk all of, all of you through how the complexity of it. And we will be I'll be talking about uh, several different sets of laws here. Um, so, as you can see, if you trace it back, uh, because the Indian legal system in India is a colonial inheritance. So, in 1956, uh, India actually adopts the suppression of uh, Immoral Trafficking Act as an independent country. But the law was actually based on the 1920 colonial law, which actually emerged in a, in a, in a moment of anxiety over white slavery, right? So that's the kind of the historical context to this. Then in 1986, Sita, which is also an interesting name for an anti-trafficking law, um, the Immoral Trafficking Prevention Act was adopted in 1986, but this is where we see the conflation of prostitution 
with trafficking. And remember, there is no, uh, no mention of sex work. That does not figure in the legal terrain at all. And then what we have is uh, uh, amendments being proposed constantly to the Anti-Trafficking Prevention Act. And in 2006, there was an amendment proposed. And I will give you the context, like why the amendment was proposed in a bit. But that would, could, did not go through because there was, a, uh, there was a lot of resistance from sex work groups, sex work organizations. So, and there was a march that was organized to the parliament. Durbar participated in the march and they successfully stalled the bill. But in 2016, the Women and Child Welfare uh, Ministry bought another bill. Uh, it was not an amendment. It's a bill that was bought in 2016. It was passed in the Lok Sabha in the lower house of parliament. But then in 2019, uh, we are, we, you know, India has its elections. And then it was kind of stalled at the Lok Sabha. It was supposed to go to go higher up, but then it didn't. However, in uh, 2021, there was another bill that was introduced, which is trafficking in person, prevention, care, and rehabilitation bill. I just want all, to draw all of your attention to the word rehabilitation. Uh, because this becomes a very, very important thing. And I would actually argue by far, this is the most heavy handed bill ever. Uh, it includes the death penalty, the involvement of the National Investigative Agency. And those of you who are familiar with India know that the NIA is actually kind of spreading its tentacles in every sphere. Um, it also applies to offenders, quote unquote offenders outside the country not just India, so outside the country. Now, this one is specifically important for labor migration routes. So for, inst for instance, between India and Nepal, so that it's gonna be, uh, that's gonna impact that. I was in a workshop with, uh, you know, uh, organizers and sex work organize organizers and anti-trafficking activists in Nepal. And they actually uh, was, they were talking about how this bill is going to impact uh, labor routes, labor right, migrant routes between India, between Nepal and India. So what this tells us is the legal pastiche in a, is in a perpetual state of flux, notably since the early 2000s, which coincides with the surge of anti-trafficking rhetoric globally. And we'll come to that. The Palermo Protocol was actually adopted in the year 2000. And what is very important to note here that when you look at all these bills and you look at all the amendments that are being proposed in the new bills, not a single sex work organization was ever consulted given that India has a pretty strong sex work movement. To add to this, we also have the constitution, right? The constitution already has article 23, which prohibits trafficking. Additionally, we have the Indian Penal Code from 1860, which also lists all these ways you can prosecute trafficking, right? And then, uh, and now we will move on to the global terrain. So it's not just the national terrain. This is where anti-trafficking is an extremely complex domain. So the global terrain has the Palermo Protocol, which was drafted in 2000. And it was highly influenced by the US because the US actually drafted its trafficking protocol before the Palermo Protocol. So it was, it was an enormous influence. And just to give you some perspective, the US is abolitionist, right? The state police and abolitionist. So if you are a, if you are a sex worker, uh, you cannot travel to the US, right? You, you will not get a visa to travel to the US. So it's an abolitionist state. So the Palermo Protocol, just like the US, uh, pro the US traffic anti-trafficking regime is very much based in, uh, in a carceral approach, in a very criminal justice uh, approach. So the, in the UN protocol, we see the definition, it defines trafficking, it defines what consent means, it defines what minors mean, it defines what, you know, movement, like who's a trafficker uh, and et cetera. And it's not yet over. So and then we have the United States Trafficking in Persons Report, which is a report that is released every year that ranks countries across the world as to how they're doing on trafficking. It has four tiers, which is tier one, which means you're doing fantastic. Tier two, you're doing okay. Tier two watch list is you're not doing so okay. And tier three is like you're doing terribly. 
Now, in 2006, um, the US degraded India to the tier two watch list. And that is when the Women and Child Welfare Ministry decided to bring that amendment, right? But India remained in the tier two watch list to 2010 and 2011, they were uh, elevated to, to uh, tier two. As of the last report, which is from 2021, India is still at tier two, but I just want to give you a sense of like the politics of this uh, apparatus is the US did not rank itself till 2010. So it ranked every country in the world other than itself. So in 2010 is the first time the US starts ranking itself. And when you look at the report, it's a, it's, I mean, I can talk more about how the reporting even happens, but when you look at the report, it is, not a coincidence that most countries in the global south are tier one and most countries in the global, sorry, global north are in the tier one and most countries in the global south are kind of oscillating between tier two and tier three. So there is a, another way to think about the geopolitics of this. Another important surveillance tool is the global slavery index, which comes out of Australia. And uh, so in 2018, they named uh, India as now they're like 53rd alongside North Korea in modern slavery. And then immediately the, you know, the Women and Child Welfare Ministry proposed another bill and that's the bill I was referring to. So these rankings have enormous um, uh, impact on non-humanitarian aid, right? So the US can block non-humanitarian aid given this uh, ranking. So the, the, these have serious consequences. So the methods uh, that I, the methodology of this research was I did ethnographic work between 2010 and 2000, actually it's 19, I was there in 19 too. Uh, so in Kolkata with Durbar, then the West Bengal State AIDS Control, the Tropical School of Medicine, that's where most of the women go to receive their um, antiretroviral therapy, those who are HIV positive or if they have progress to AIDS, unfortunately that's the hospital they go to. And then of course there are police stations. I um, did my field work, which includes the local police station and also Lal Bajar, which is the headquarters. The child welfare committee, that's where a minor, quote unquote, a minor is handed over if they are found uh, traffic to Shonagachi. I also worked quite a bit with the Central Forensic Science uh, Laboratory because the determination of a minor is an extremely complex task. In New Delhi, I worked with NACO, which is the Nation National AIDS Control Organization, and also the Ministry of Women and Child Development. Um, archival research at the British Library, which uh, I, was in, I was looking at the Indian, Indian Contagious Diseases Act because an entire chapter is on that, because there is a very uncanny resonance between the Contagious Diseases Act of the mid 19th century and the current HIV AIDS prevention programming. So I was kind of interested. And it also ties in with, you know, uh, imperial feminism as well. So it's, it's another whole world. I was also interested in primary resources. Uh, there are not many. Uh, so, you know, autobiographies of sex workers, um, which offer insights into past configurations of prostitution, uh, caste class in late uh, colonial Bengal. And the field work was, you know, um, structured and unstructured. Uh, a lot of time uh, was spent with the peer educators, visiting field sites, uh, attending organization meetings, attending uh, a lot of self-regulatory board meetings on one of which I will be talking about today. Uh, social functions, then, uh, you know, accompanying sex workers to the public hospitals because it's a very, uh, it's a very difficult space for them to navigate because most of the instructions are in English and because of the stigma they carry, they're always, um, you know, further re-victimized because when the people find out their addresses in Shonagachi. And there were a lot of uh, collaboration with the police in terms of anti-trafficking and government offices. And then I also worked with uh, lots of doctors and uh, public health practitioners, especially epidemiologists um, and others. So what I've decided today is I'm going to uh, talk about the idea of uh, FERA, which is uh, in, Bengali, in Bengali we say FERA uh, or return. And uh, so, and I'm going to, before I get into the ethnography, just want to give you uh, some, an overview of the board itself. 
So the self-regulatory board is an interesting um, institution because it does not have the state mandate, right? Yet we can see that the sex work established it actually pretty early on in 1997. And just as a reminder, it actually precedes the Parliament Protocol, which was drafted in 2000. So they uh, in these start initially. So obviously they, uh, they submit to the anti-trafficking regime and want to showcase their commitment to anti-trafficking themselves but at the same time, they subvert it by kind of reclaiming anti-trafficking as a work they are very able to do. And truly speaking, nobody knows the red light district as well as they do, right? So there is a way that they have a kind, they are against anti-trafficking just like the state is, but at the same time, they have reclaimed anti-trafficking as a way to redefine the question of crime, right? That it's not a question of crime, it's, and they adapt what is, uh, it's it's a very human rights approach, and <clears throat> it's based on um, a, it's a deep understanding of sisterhood. But at the same time, I do want to say that I don't use my use of sisterhood is not exactly uncritical. So that's why you see that in quotes. And importantly, the board uh, departs from the carceral approach to uh, anti-trafficking. And finally, what we see is that they interrogate constructions of legal concepts such as which we find in the Palermo Protocol and, and in, uh, in, in the Indian trafficking laws, such as, you know, what is consent? What is migration? What is, who is a victim? Who is a trafficker? Because on the ground, these are extremely complex concepts and it's very, very difficult to draw neat boundaries in around them if you are taking a carceral approach, right? Because with a carceral approach, the idea is to punish, uh, to imprison and punish. And what it takes out is the human, like the, there's a human story behind this, and then it takes out the human rights approach. So part of the work, part of my larger work is to kind of see how we, we can move away from from a, from a punitive criminal justice approach to a more, an approach based on a human understanding of uh, trafficking. Okay, sorry. so the composition of the board is usually nine to 10 members, five, five of them are from the community. They all, have, they all have to be sex workers, but they're also uh, the local counselor, the medical, somebody from the, somebody like a doctor or a medical fraternity, somebody from the legal profession, uh, a social welfare, somebody from the social welfare board and others like me who are interested. However, I do have to say that during my years of ethnographic work, I've really never seen anybody other than sex workers uh, participate in the board uh, meetings. So uh, this, is, this is a pretty aspirational institution, I do want to say that. So, uh, but in practice, it's, it was usually always um, the sex workers who are. Now, <clears throat> I just want to also share the flow chart that the board uses. Now, this may look pretty neat and simple, but actually it is not. So it starts with the identification, right? You identify that a new woman or a young girl has arrived in Shonagatsi. Uh, she's identified the, by the peer educators, and then she's taken for counseling with the, the there's a social worker who is employed by Durbar who engages in counseling uh, because, you know, it's, it, 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 it's a traumatic experience in many ways. And then the SRB, the board review begins um, to determine the status, uh, which can be three is first, it could be a minor. If, if she's a minor, then she obviously will have to return home. And uh, the recent regulation is that she will have to be handed over to the child welfare committee. Uh, if she's an unwilling adult, then, uh, then it gets quite tricky, and I'm going to, going to focus on this today. Um, I mean, obviously, she will return home, but that's where the question of the home becomes very tricky. And then, of course, if she's a willing adult, then, uh, you know, the, the members of Durbar talk to her about, you know, the, the kind of labor, the hazards of the labor, the importance of medical checkups and all of that. Just to give you an idea, this board sessions actually last rather long. The longest one I've attended lasted five days. And they're very, very 
arduous um, and very painstaking and very detailed work. So <clears throat> what I have done, those of you who are familiar with anti-trafficking scholarship, you will know that um, anti-trafficking scholarship uses like a case studies approach, but I have taken a different approach here because um, what I've done is I have identified themes in a way we can humanize the process, right? So these are the themes, uh, uh, and this is the word, you know, you often hear in Chonagatsu that I saw a notunmuk, which means new face. And that's very, it's, it, Konishwanagachi, just to give you an idea of the physical space, is a very congested, overcrowded space. So any person who is new arrives in Chonagachi, it's very difficult not to be recognized. So it, it's it's kind of obvious, like you're new. Um, so Notunmuk, and then when the board starts um, talking to the person who arrived, the woman who arrived uh, to Shonagati, like how she arrived, because arrival is a very important thing because the Palermo protocol and the legal system, legal, the law says tr uh, like transportation, migration, right? It has to involve migration. Like you have to be from place A to place B. Trafficking, that, that is mobility and migration are very critical to trafficking. So arrival, like how did you arrive is a very important question here. The other thing that happens, and this is where it takes a lot of time, is the shifting stories. So, um, so the women present different biographical accounts, and they, they're very inconsistent. But at the same time, to think of them as like you know mere lies would actually just miss the larger structural picture of deprivation and struggle. Then we have the making, then I have something called the making and the unmaking of the minor. And this is another extremely difficult thing to do. Who is a minor? Right. So the best test in way you can determine who is a minor is genetic testing, but that's not in use in India. It's very expensive. So they use bone ossification test. Now, bone ossification is not a very conclusive test because it's about, you know, <clears throat> it's it's how the bone can indicate your age. But nutrition is a very important component of bone ossification. So it does not really uh, give you an accurate um, uh, in a conclusion. And all, at the same time, it also gives you a range. So a, a bone ossification test might come back as she's between uh, 17 and 21, right? So 18, if 18 is the age of consent, then you're kind of in between 17 and 21. So it's not at all a conclusive test. And I've spent a lot of time with the forensic scientists in Calcutta, and they have actually um, you know, told me that this is one of the most challenging things, not just in anti-trafficking work, but largely speaking. And the final thing is the return, right? Um, what I also wanted to do with this, uh, you know, using a thematic approach uh, to also kind of look at, because a lot of my book also looks at the linguistic moves that happen in Shonagati around anti-trafficking and around HIV AIDS. And I'm very curious about like how these moves actually happen. So I can talk about this later. Like the, a lot of the women make a distinction between pachar in Bengali and trafficking. So those of you who know Bengali know that pachar actually means trafficking, but they say, no, they have not been trafficked, it's pachar. So there is an interesting linguistic word and my, the, my book's uh, table of contents actually includes all the Bengali words and the editor has not uh, objected to that, which is good. Um, and finally, I thought the thematic approach would be a very fruitful way to see how the juridical notions of uh, trafficking, you know, intersect, collide, converge with notions of sisterhood and how they start beginning to relate to one another as uh, sisters. I have this uh, long quote here, I'm going to read it. And so I put it on a slide so that it's easy to follow. So this is from a specific uh, session I attended, and it's pretty emblematic of others. And this is somebody, Purnimadi, who was my primary collaborator in the field. And at that time, she was also the director of the board. So the question of return was perhaps the most difficult for the board. On one hand, when someone was deemed, quote unquote, a minor, it generated tension between and amongst the newcomer, the Malkin, who's a brothel owner, and the board. Purnimadi, 
constant, consistently and strongly maintained her position as the director that the board has to prevent minors from being trafficked and he, there will be no other way in Shonagachi to join sex work. On the other hand, it was legally required to hand minors over to the child welfare committee who were then admitted to shelters. Scholars have demonstrated that shelters, which are called homes in India, are mostly carceral institutions. The board was acutely aware of, its, of their appalling conditions and every time they were quite hesitant to entrust children to the care of these homes. They characterized these places as Places, quote, places with no motherly love, end of quote. I visited a couple of shelters in Kolkata and can elaborate on these later. The board in general and Purnimati in specific had been navigating this double bind for a while. The situation with unwilling adult women is similar. When they're not wanted back by their families for the fear of stigma of being found in a red light district. But the board had more agency in organizing the return of adult women. Though this practice was no longer in vogue during most of my fieldwork, often Purnimadi would recount how personally, how she personally accompanied the women to their villages in the recent past. However, here is one such, here is one such account in detail, which is illustrative of this portion of the boat's anti-trafficking work. And this is, uh, <clears throat> if you want to follow me along <clears throat> as I read it. So one time, and this is Purnimadi speaking, one time I, along with board member, one of another board member was taking this woman back to her village. She was not a minor, but she was not willing to join sex work. She came to Shonagachi with her lover, but she did not know that this is the kind of work she had to do. She said, no, we told her, we will take you back to your village. She gave us the address and we set off on our journey. It was a village about three hours outside Kolkata, so we first got on the bus to go to Shialda. Shialda is the, one of the main uh, railway stations in the city. And then on the train, when we got off the train, we had to walk several kilometers. Much of it was on the Al. Al is actually a little bit of a raised, uh, like, you know, tilled earth to separate the crop fields. And it's not really easy walking on Al, which for Unimati was not easy as a city, city person used to walking on paved streets. Anyway, after walking for, I think, two hours, we reached the village square. Some men were waiting there, and as soon as they saw us, they circled us, asking who we were and why was one of our girls, Amadirne, with us. It was scary. But in such situations, we have to keep calm. I told them that we found her at the Shialba station. She got lost, and we have come to return her. Now, I cannot tell them that we found her in Shonagasi, because then her life would be over. Now, for many people in the villages, they know, may know nothing about Kolkata, but everybody knows about Shonagachi. And men from the villages often come here, meaning Shonagachi. So we had to be very careful. They already knew that she was missing, but were somewhat suspicious about my story. So I started referring to them as my brothers. And Dada, which we used in Bengali to refer to an older brother, she said, Dada, you know how difficult it must have been for one of your daughters to be lost in the big city. Aren't you glad that she's safe and has returned home? This worked well most of the time, but it was always important to keep in mind, whatever we say, we cannot give away the real story. We have to keep our sisters in mind. It took us a lot of effort, but I will say we did the anti-trafficking work as best as we could, end of quote. Purnivati held a silent pride in the work and was disappointed when Durga decided to discontinue the restitution of trafficked adults. When I inquired about this decision, the primary reasons were lack of funds and also increasing police surveillance on the work on the board, which was deepened by new abolitionist organizations accusing Durga of pimping. Other members of the board shared Purnimadi's sentiment, though they could never be certain that the family would unequivocally accept the traffic victim, but still there was some solace in knowing that she was reunited with her family. As one member had put it once, quote, at least we have done our part. It felt good. She is after all a human being, like a sister to us, only trying to survive and not a criminal like the police think, end of quote. There was an overall sense of closure to this otherwise very demanding work of anti-trafficking. 
On the other hand, having determined that a woman was trafficked and asking her to leave Chonagazi obviously created another form of turmoil. And I can talk more about it later in the question answer session because Anne Marie Singh, I've <laughs> So there was one woman, her name was Sunita, and this happened in uh, December of 2018. She was, uh, she was asked, she was trafficked by her mother through a pimp. And she didn't want to join sex work. And so obviously she was going to be sent back to the village. So the board called the mother, the mother came to, um, you know, pick her up. But at the same time, you know, um, there was a lot after the lift, there was a lot of unease amongst the, amongst the sex workers. Like one doesn't really know whether she even left Chonagasi to go to Kalighat. Kalighat is another red light district in the city or to another red light district, maybe another part of the state. So one doesn't know. And I remember one of the sex workers at the end, um, you know, observed that, you know, quote, who knows whether they left Shonagachi for Kaligat, which is the other red light district, uh, or in another state or even elsewhere. Uh, we will never know. I feel we could not really save this woman, this specific woman uh, I met in 2018. Uh, just like the others who leave uh, Shonagasi. To conclude, I want to underscore that anti-trafficking work is inseparable from both a structural understanding and an approach based on human rights. Though this conversation has began with the completion of the 20th year of the Palermo Protocol in 2020, the apparatus is nonetheless deeply rooted in a carceral approach. In specifically centering the question of return in relation to home, that is a place where one returns to, we see how the unity of the quote unquote victim as a legal monolith begins to unravel. Several women return to Shonagatsi because the stubborn stru structural barriers of poverty endure and deepen. Yet it is in Shonagatsi many women eventually find a place they can call home or body. In other words, the brothel becomes their home. Thank you all for your time, and I'd be happy to answer questions. And thank you, Afke, for all the slides. <laughs>